But the interesting thing about HydroStore as an energy technology is that we can approach benefits to mines from two perspectives. So one is obviously on the energy operational side of things um, and those types of cost savings and better reliability and so on. Uh, but also we use significant underground infrastructure for our applications. And so therefore we can actually, you know, in it, translate old or underutilized mining infrastructure into an energy asset for a mine, which can actually become revenue generating depending on where this is. So a little bit of background about HydroStore uh, as, before I dive into the technology. Um, we're a Toronto-based company. We've been around for the past eight years. Um, we're really a, a technology solution provider, but also a storage project developer. We build these projects at a very large scale, and we do it globally, uh, largely for power systems. We work with utilities and independent power producers to meet very large-scale grid needs. Uh, but we also do a fair amount of work with mining companies, and it'll become obvious why we do that as we go through our applications. Um, we have one operating facility here in Toronto, which has been in place since 2015, really proved out our technology and our approach to compressed air energy storage. Um, we have one under construction right now, which is a commercial facility contracted to the grid operator here in Ontario. And we have another that uh, is in early stage construction now in Australia, which actually is at a mine, and we're using mining infrastructure there as our air storage cavity. Uh, we have a pretty significant pipeline as well, and I'd be happy to answer questions about that in terms of large scale applications that we're looking at. So what is advanced compressed air energy storage? What are we, what are we talking about here? Really, um, traditional compressed air, you're taking uh, a compressor, you're taking electricity, you're translating it into high pressure air, you're storing it in a cavity, typically underground. Uh, and then when you're, you're storing that energy, and then when you're ready to generate, you're releasing it and it's running a turbine, you're generating electricity. What we do at HydroStore is we've taken the need for natural gas out of the process. Normally that requires a heat source that you have to inject when you're generating the electricity. We take heat from our compression cycle, we store it uh, underground, and then we re-inject it into our, our turbine. But also what we do is we use purpose-built storage cavities underground. Uh, and we can do that, whereas other types of storage like pumped hydro storage or traditional compressed air, their volume requirements are so massive that it's just, it's not, it's technically feasible, it's just not really viable for them to ever do that cost effectively. When we put the math together on how we construct this together, we use um, a, a reservoir on the surface and we use water to compensate for the air pressure. And the advantage of that is that it really makes the air much more efficient. So it's, it's a constant pressure state. You can picture it as a piston almost between the top reservoir and an underground reservoir where when you're compressing air in, you're displacing the water up into the top reservoir. When you're ready to generate, you're basically just flipping a valve and the, the weight of the water is pushing the air out and running the turbine. That's constant pressure. So that's how the turbines were meant to run. It's much more efficient. It's much more volume efficient so that we can work with mining companies, mining contractors really globally and construct these cavities very similar to the way that they make hydrocarbon storage cavities. Um, the advantage from a, a mining perspective is, is perhaps obvious. There are many cases, we're already working with mining majors globally, uh, in uh, Australia in particular, and also in the United States, to reutilize their mining infrastructure underground so that it saves some of our construction costs. For instance, we might not have to build a big ramp or decline down if we have access down to our storage cavity, which is down about 1,000 feet. Um, if, uh, and we have variability that we can have in that height. If we can use void space, even better. Um, and we don't require perfectly impermeable void space either. We have liner technologies that we use, and we integrate this all into a, a, a package that works for utilities as a storage solution for them. What do we use it for, though, really, at the end of the day? Well, if you're uh, take kind of a utility hat and say, well, what would I use this for? It's really cost effective at large scale. Like we're talking, you know, if you're going to build a greenfield system, it's going to be 100, 200, 300 megawatts in size. But the great thing is you're kind of like a gas plant. 
and you can site where a coal-fired generating facility is. You can construct the facility there. There's not big permitting issues because you're not a, an emitting facility, which can be problematic in places like California. Because we're so large scale too, we're, we're very low cost at that scale. So much cheaper than other forms of storage technology. But again, it's gotta be at a large scale. And critically, we can site where it's required. So pumped hydro is a great technology. Uh, but you need the topology, you, you, it's not where the grid typically requires it, it's a very unusual circumstance that it is. We can, in most circumstances, put this in, you know, where a fossil facility requires or where the grid requires it. Um, from a mining uh, application perspective, again, the, the advantage is significantly reducing our capex, right? So if we can utilize infrastructure on site at a mine, even if the mine doesn't require that electricity, that can become an asset for serving the electrical grid. And we, in fact, are looking at those very applications in Chile, for example, just repurposing abandoned mines for this purpose to serve the grid, not even to serve the mine. When you add on serving the mine on top of that, um, you know, there are needs to off-grid mines, for example, would have uh, fairly expensive diesel generation in a lot of cases. We're working with one mine right now to pair with significant amounts of solar generation and basically make a baseload dispatchable renewable energy product that's still cheaper than the all-in cost of that diesel power for the site. So it's a pretty significant offsetting factor. I kind of alluded to the fact that even without that need, it creates a new revenue opportunity for the mine. And something to think about there as well, uh, you guys would know better than I do in your facilities, but often, you know, there's a decommissioning liability associated with whatever these facilities are. If you repurpose it into an electrical generating asset, that can be deferred in many cases, sometimes indefinitely while that's operating. Clearly, a, a, you know, a long-term benefit there. And even for mines that are grid connected, not only you know, can we provide grid services directly and utilize the mine for that purpose, we can provide benefits either in the form of peak shifting, better reliability, uh, capacity at the mine, or in a case uh, like we're looking at in Australia right now, we can offset the need for transmission, that they need to upgrade their transmission to, to be serving their load, uh, and we can offset their demand charges, which get very expensive. And to give you an idea of how we do that, we take our, our facility and we pair with solar so that while it's generating during the day, we're basically taking that generation and making it into a 24-hour product. We can do that, whereas that would be almost absurdly expensive with batteries, for example, but just because we're using this void space. And so, you know, the marginal cost of us putting additional storage in is, is not terribly high, particularly if we can leverage the underground infrastructure to begin with. And so the benefit there is you then really are reducing the kilowatts of demand at this facility. You are obviating the need for transmission. You're offsetting demand charges. And in a lot of cases, like in Australia, for example, we can provide services on the grid at the same time. If you think about it here in Ontario, very similar sort of application potential. Obviously, there's a, an opportunity to uh, displace global adjustment charges. Uh, so there's a you know, peak shifting benefit here in Ontario. Um, this can do that at a quite a large scale. And even though, you know, for a greenfield application, we would look at, say, 100, 200, 300 megawatts, if we are using existing infrastructure at a mine, we can be more in the 5, 10, 20 megawatt type scale. So it really just depends on the, the scale of the facility and what your load requirements are and, and so on. And just to give you an idea, we talked a little bit about the, the, our project experience. Um, we've proven out the, the way that this system integrates together, the, the water compensation or thermal storage in Toronto, which has been operating since 2015. Uh, the ISO grid operator here uh, has seen enough commercial potential in it to actually commercially contract for this. So we are in a full contract with them with full LDs and so on, for supplying power. Uh, that'll be COD in January. Um, and in Australia, the mine owner is actually called Terramin. They're a fairly, uh, fairly small scale zinc uh, miner. Um, we are, th their site is actually relatively small. And so like I've indicated before, we can do it at a smaller scale because we're leveraging their underground infrastructure. So 
you can kind of see a cross section, you can't see it that well, but we're using some of their void space underground. We're using their decline portal and ramp uh, as a hydraulic connection to our surface reservoir. And in fact, we've designed it in a way that allows them access to their ramp in case they need access to the zinc whenever that price rises to their, their break even point. Um, so we're not even using the ramp for the hydraulic connection there, we're using a series of uh, raised bores that we've put in place to uh, the surface reservoir. So we can work flexibly with the mine depending on uh, what's required at that site. In that case, we're simply supplying electrical services onto the grid and we're giving them a revenue source by leasing the site and giving them a new uh, revenue source for a mine that really isn't generating any revenue right now other than uh, perhaps being a, a decommissioning liability. And we continue to work with uh, mining majors particularly focused in North America, Australia, and Chile. Those are kind of our core markets right now, uh, but with intent of growing into global applications over the next two years as well, or global beyond that. Uh, and much of that, you know, 1500 megawatt plus pipeline that you're seeing there is, is really just projects at utilities to replace coal-fired generating facilities, to provide transmission alternatives for utilities. And largely this is located in Australia and California, in Chile, uh, here in Canada, particularly out east. And so in cases where, and in Ontario, and in cases where we can you know, leverage those grid benefits with also mining infrastructure that's around, that could provide some really uh, near-term benefits as well. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys might have or very happy to talk at the reception as well. Um, and my contact information is provided. So thank you. Questions for John? Yeah, right here in the front. Please speak loudly. Yes. Uh, did you encounter any uh, problem with the Iraq integrity under the uh, problem? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a complicated question. We obviously work with a number of geotechnical consultants who have different requirements depending on whether we're building out a greenfield cavity or, or working at a mine. So typically, our two big characteristics that we're looking for are competency of the rock, which are gonna establish our structural requirements and in which seam we actually wanna build in if we're doing it on a greenfield basis, and then permeability. And the permeability issue is really just more, do we require a liner or don't we? Uh, what's the best lining approach? In many cases, particularly hard rock mines that we would work with, uh, we don't even require a liner because it's a, a fairly um, impermeable rock formation to begin with often. And the other thing is that water isn't, like obviously there's lots of water underground, that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. If there is water, that creates an impermeable, we're basically creating a bubble underground, right? And, and that becomes an impermeable seal to begin with. I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, but yeah. This is the last one over there. Yeah. No. In fact, our the project that's contracted to the IESO is a constant volume system. So it uses our thermal storage process, but it's in a salt cavern, kind of like traditional compressed air. Uh, most of our growth potential is really in the uh, fixed pressure App for you know, uh, applications because we can purpose build that cavity. So the great innovation is you can put that on the grid where, where it's required. So we wouldn't rule that out. It's just typically that requires a much larger volume. And so the cavity requirement can be very large. But we stole your idea, I guess. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, and the, the turbine manufacturers are pretty accustomed to that stuff. So, you know, it's really just factored in the basic engineering. Uh, but they, they make these air turbines all the time with different moisture contents, and it's used in the oil and gas industry. Yeah. 
Yeah. It really, really lasts well. Robin, you know we, the bar is coming up soon, so you're prolonging this, yeah. but Robin, please, go ahead. How much do you produce, uh, what's the cost of energy per kilowatt hour? On an operating cost, and let's say a daughter each type, capital cost, yeah, so for our full-scale pipeline, we would be between 150 a kilowatt hour to 250 a kilowatt hour U.S. And I find that as a funny metric. Usually what they're looking for on the grid is more dollars per kilowatt of capacity that you can provide, and we're between 1,500 to 2,500 per, per kilowatt. Happy to give you more information on that offline as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you.